G'day humans, welcome to the safe space for dangerous ideas. Uh, here's an uncomfortable situation for you. Uh, you're stark naked and uh, you're getting it on with uh, someone you've never met before, surrounded by a whole group of people who are holding lighting rigs and cameras and uh, uh, sandwiches. It seems weird. Why would you spend your life doing this? Well, Angela White is here to tell us. Uh, she's a smart cookie. She graduated with first class honours from the University of Melbourne, studying gender studies, but from an early age wanted to become a porn star and has become by far the most successful adult film actress in Australia. Not just in Australia, I mean, she's had a big career in the United States. She is the most award winning female performer in adult entertainment history with literally hundreds of awards in adult film Oscars. She's in the top 0.01% of OnlyFans creators. She basically presides over a multi-million dollar empire that is herself. We wanted to talk about gender and sex and taboos and feminism. Enjoy it, the one and only Angela White. Oh, how are you? I'm great. How do you find... Are you on a big media tour at the moment? Yeah, are you, talk, are you do, talking to idiots like me constantly and having to no, uh, face the same questions over and over again? I do get a lot of the same questions, but yeah. every now and then I get an, an interesting question. That do you I enjoy it? Before. Like I this do. process? Yeah, it's yeah. fun. Is there a time... Like, are people sometimes prurient in the questions they I ask? I don't mind. You I don't mean, mind that's that. my job, yes, sort of, right. to get into the dirty details. You so. sort of brought that on yourself, yeah, didn't I'm, you, really, I, with your choice of career? I like talking about sex. Yeah. And I like talking about things that people find uncomfortable. Is that so. part of the... <laughs> thank you. Yeah. I only just, I just, it's early in the morning. I didn't even get the reference. Uh, uncomfortable conversations. That's my show, right? Yeah, that's, yes, that's yeah, the name that's of the show. That's where we are. That's, what we're, that's where we are. Good. What we're doing well, today. Thanks for the reminder. Um, <laughs> is that part of the appeal for you? Is the transgressiveness of it? Or does that just come along for the ride? Mm, it's Well, that's not why I got in, but it's fun to be able to live a life where I get to do things that people feel that they can't do or they feel shame around. Yeah. I li like for me I've always been fascinated by sex and sexuality and and part of that fascination I think has been driven by the fact that it's so taboo and it's mm. so secret and you're not supposed to talk about it or know about it. I'm yeah. interested in this aspect of you because you're quite intellectual about it and you know you wrote a thesis about this yes. when were you doing a masters in uh, honors. Or an honors yeah. and I mean I read the the um the abstract of the of the thesis and it made an interesting point that I hadn't really thought of which is that when you're doing porn, you're able to explore your own sexuality and the fun of sex in ways that are completely disengaged, I'm probably mangling your words, but like detached from the ordinary motivations of sex, yes. the ordinary sexual identities that you might inhabit, you yes. know, the ordinary incentives for sex, mm -hmm. all of that is turned on its head. So you're stripping away just the sort of pure sex act and doing it in this mm -hmm. funny cloud space that doesn't have any of the, that doesn't obey any of the normal rules that human beings associate with yeah. sex. Was Is that... The appeal or? That became part of the appeal. So the reason I got into pornography was to express and explore my sexuality. At that point, I was looking for a And you were quite young. I was young. So it was the age of 14 that I decided I wanted to get into pornography. Obviously, the legal age to perform is 18. So I had four years to research pornography and figure out, okay, is this really what I want to do? And all your friends are going, mom, I want a Pokemon. <laughs> I, want, I want to get my driver's license. You're like, I want to be an adult film star. Yes. Right. So I waited till I was 18. And then as soon as I turned 18, as soon as I was legal, I was on a plane to America. And to why? Shoot. Do you know why? Do you have enough? Yeah, it was because... So when I developed sexually, I was very curious. I really wanted to explore all facets of my sexuality. It felt very core to who I was. And every single way that I expressed my sexuality was criticized. So this was in high school. I was slut shamed. I was expressing my sexuality with both men and women. It was not cool at that time to be kissing girls in the quadrangle. In fact, oh my goodness, yeah. imagine today. I know. You wouldn't have had to become a porn star. Right? You'd just be the coolest kid in um, school. Well, you Be know, like, I guess lucky it was, you know, not as, yeah, not as <laughs> open back then. Yeah. Well, I mean, and then you'd have to screw around with gender though today as well. You'd have to yeah. be a little bit they, them about it, I think, to be extra cool oh, in the okay. playground. Well, you know what I mean? Yeah. Like, to get the, the full on cred. <laughs> um, okay. So you're like 14. Your friends are sort of, they're not that into the fact that you're exploring sexuality well, in an overt way. My friends, I had a core group of friends that, you know, accepted me and were, they, they just sure. knew me. That's, that's yes. Angela. Yes. Uh, but the rest of the high school 
would criticize me for the ways I expressed and explored my sexuality. And pornography was the first space that I saw women being celebrated for expressing and exploring their sexuality. It was the first place where I saw that you could have sex with multiple people and it be a wonderful thing rather than something to be slut shamed over. And so there was the the sexual aspect to it, but then there was also the the body aspect to it because back then, Plus size modeling wasn't a thing. When I was reading magazines, it was Dolly and Girlfriend. You weren't seeing different types of bodies being represented in mainstream media. It was very, it was very much that stick thin look. And I developed quite early. By 14, I had double D breasts. I was very curvy and I just didn't see myself represented. But pornography was the first place that I saw women like me, again, being celebrated. Mm. And having large natural breasts, the only breasts that I was seeing on TV, in magazines, were were small breasts. And small breasts look very different to large breasts when they're outside of a bra. You know, big natural boobs hang. And porn was the first place I saw other boobs like mine. Right. So, and were you? did you feel self-conscious about your physicality or were you – did people – did you read as hot? I mean, did people want to have sex with you when you were in your teens? It was – I developed very quickly. Not – I wouldn't say very early, actually. My friends developed earlier than me. But by the by the age of 14 – When it happened, it happened. When it happened, The it trains happened. leaving the station. Yes, it happened very fast. And yep. so I got both positive and negative attention all at once. I got right. a lot of positive attention from – older men. I was just going to ask that. Yes. I'll bet that, yeah, yeah, right. Okay. So suddenly you look precocious. Yeah. The older creeps yes, absolutely. are like, woo. <laughs> but it was a strange time because I was really excited about exploring my sexuality, but at the same time, I had these large purple stretch marks on my breast, like tiger stripes. And so I was very self-conscious. So I was in this weird realm where it's like, I really want to be sexual and intimate with people, but also like do, are my boobs okay? Like, do, right. are people going to want to have sex with me I mean, when every, they look like this? Doesn't every fifteen-year-old feel self-conscious about their body, depending on whatever their body is, or do you think it was unusually pronounced um, for you? I guess everyone has a little bit of self-consciousness at that right. age, just not but big I, boob stretch marks. Right. I think mine were just. It was just very big, very quickly, right. very purple. <laughs> it was like, <laughs> I had very I want to see a Pantene skin. color shade to get the exact oh, type of purple. Was, uh, are we talking a kind of a uh, like a what shade of purple are we talking about? Fuchsia. A fuchsia. Was, we're talking was, about fuchsia stretch yeah, marks. Yeah, and I had extremely pale skin. Right. So it was yeah. And were you interested okay. in sex for sex or was sex – like for a lot of teenagers, you're exploring new emotions about love and attraction and the adulation that you feel for other people mm. and how are you going to fit into the world and how are you going to be cared for and not judged and all that sort of stuff. And so sex becomes – or like a, the erotic impulse becomes wrapped up also in those emotional mm. needs. And so people will find themselves in relationships maybe with older people who find who have a caring relationship for them. Uh, was that there or was it just like, want to get my rocks off? That's just where I'm at. I was horny. Like, <laughs> <laughs> really, like, the, when I'm it comes down to I've just given you this it, big poetic yeah, opportunity like, I was very horny. Like, this was a Shakespearean sonnet. <laughs> nah. I was a very, very sexual teen. In right. fact, well... And do you think that's just hardwired? That's just something that your, your body is just doing? It's I not think really, so. Right. I think so. Because talking to my mum about her teen years and how she was, she was also a very sexual teen. So I think it might be genetic. Right. Um, and I guess... It, it kind of makes sense. I developed so quickly. So obviously the hormones are surging to just develop my breasts that quickly. It makes sense that also the hormones are surging and making me incredibly horny. Mm. But even before that, even before the hormones, I was always fascinated and repulsed actually by sex. It was it was very um, – Aren't we all? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I think that repulsion made me even more interested in it because I was that weird kid in the back of the library reading Where Did We Come From, staring at the cartoon images of yeah. men and women copulating and looking at the penises. Like I was just fascinated by that. Mm. And then when I saw the full frontal nudity in Life of Brian, Monty Python's Life of Brian, that was – Isn't like, that hilarious? That part of the VHS got – Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> got 
got a lot of action. <laughs> yeah, I got a lot of action. <sighs> I was just fascinated by naked bodies. Right. Fascinated by sex. Isn't it incredible though that you needed to be watching the life of Brian to get right. your porn yeah. in the eighties? Like what a what a what a world today. <laughs> like what would become what do you think is becoming of the little versions of you who are fourteen in twenty twenty four? Well, with that, the amount of access that they have to... Yeah, I think... I mean, is it a good thing or a bad thing to have as I, much access as we do to porn? What I... I don't... So I don't think it's a it's a, a, a either or thing. I think that what we really need today, and pr- I mean, really back then as well, but even more so today, is we need age-appropriate sex education and porn literacy. Because I gained access to real pornography at the age of 14, and now that's... Would on be considered what, VHS tapes? VHS and magazines. So yeah. that's what I had. And then eventually dial Those up are different internet. though, aren't they, than what you can find online? Well, yeah, there's more Especially variety you, yeah. online. And in some ways it's actually – the internet democratised porn. So now you see even more diverse body types being represented and more sexual acts. And there's – every single fetish you can possibly imagine is represented online, which I think ultimately is a good thing for adults. It's adult entertainment – it's something made by adults for adults. Mm. So it's a great thing for adults because you can find what you're looking for. But, you know, when it comes to younger people, really they shouldn't be accessing pornography. And I think it's the job of parents to be educating their children. I mean, just on a personal level for you, yeah. though, do you think that you would be better off today, growing up in the environment of today? Or do you think that it was useful for you to not have as much access as you could have to the different varieties of... I, I, I couldn't even answer that question. I mean, it's that that is my history. Is that's yeah. that's what I had access to? Because I mean, I so. guess some, I guess what I'm sort of echoing. I don't have kids who are old enough for this to be a problem yet, though I shudder to imagine what's going to happen when they are, or what the world's going to be like, or what mm-hmm. kind of virtual reality, augmented reality headsets they're going to be accessing porn through. Um, but you know, I, there's a concern that I hear that teenagers today have a lot of access to mm. to porn that can fall into sort of tropes or stereotypes. There's a lot of like, oh, you're choking the woman or you're coming all over her face. Or like there are, there are things that people regard as being demeaning mm-hmm. that perhaps the more sort of traditional 1980s VHS tape that you kind of watched because, you know, your friend's dad had it stashed behind a bookshelf somewhere was probably more innocuous or... Uh, there was still less weird ejaculation, facial ejaculations in those VHS tapes. Yes. I don't. Maybe not that. Then, like, I don't know, because I don't spend a lot of time exploring the depths of online internet <laughs> porn. I don't know what is out there, but there certainly seems to be a sense, and it may just yeah. be a moral panic. Yeah. But there seems to be a sense that there's um, a landscape of things that mm. young people can stumble across today that they couldn't in the past that are probably n- that yes maybe 10 percent of it is helpful to their flourishing because it's things they wouldn't otherwise have seen mm. they can feel included diverse body types fetishes that they might have that are harmless but then there's a worry that, that there's a kind of quite misogynistic world of violent adjacent porn that I think is that's not helpful a, a mischaracterization of the majority of pornography I think that, you know, anti-porn crusaders are really focusing on the things that they don't like and suggesting that that's the majority of porn. I mean, there is – there's you can find anything on the internet, but they'll focus on, say, a woman being submissive in a scene when there's just as many scenes being shot where a man is being submissive. Fem- femdom is a extremely popular category of online uh, internet pornography. Mm. Extremely popular. So, yeah, and, and probably of sex work. Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah. So I just think it's a mischaracterization of what's being shot. The The majority of mainstream pornography is actually quite vanilla. Right. Yeah, right. it's your average everyday sex. Yeah. Except there's a camera and they're opening up to the light. So let's let's go back to your adolescence because I think it's fascinating and the evolution of your thinking about sexuality and how you wanted to express it. The... So you're, you're like making out with girls, making out with boys. Mm-hmm. This resonates with me a lot. I'm married to a guy now um, mm-hmm. but had long relationships with girls when I was younger and it wasn't quite – didn't clear about why we were so insistent about putting people into boxes of, mm-hmm. you know, oh, you have to be gay or you have to be, um, you know, a lesbian or you have to be straight or yeah. you're bisexual. I was like, can't you just sort of – like, what about the person? Like, yeah. isn't it just motivated by the person? Um 
does that is that sort was that sort of your experience? Yeah, or? there. Well, there was. Uh, I mean, I think high school is just a rough place to be. Kids yeah. are going to tease you about anything that they can possibly tease you about. This was before we had slut walks and and, and embracing of women exploring their sexuality. Although it's still not we're still not where we need to be. And uh, but I don't know that if I had chosen a category that I would have been saved. I think that the fact that I was wanting to have sex with multiple people was a problem. Right. Regardless so, of regardless. whether you'd been fully straight yeah. or fully gay. Yeah. I just or whatever. think it was just problematic. Yeah. And I think also because I was very unashamed about it and I didn't keep it a secret yeah. because I was enjoying myself and And you probably partly liked prodding people and provoking people. I never really thought about that. I don't know that I did because I felt ostracized. I f- and and that was part of me moving into the porn industry and finding this safe space for me to express myself with like-minded peers. Like once I got into porn, I really felt like, oh, this is my family. Like this is this is right. where I belong. So I didn't I I, I didn't feel accepted. In high but school. there can be a response to exclusion, and I've yeah. felt it myself, where when you get excluded from the cool kids club, you can either try, you know, there's some some personality types will try to clamor all the more to be included, mm. and other personality types, which is like mine, will say, fuck you, I never wanted to be part of your club in the first place, and do yeah. things that even further antagonize mm. the club and lean into the outsider yeah. status because you don't want to be a conformist. Yeah. So I'm just wondering which of those you... I would, I mean, I'm definitely in the latter, I guess, leaning into that and doubling down on this is what I want to do. So yeah. Yeah. fuck, so fuck you fuck guys. You. Yeah. But at the same time, is that like how much of a choice is that? Like the, cho- the, ch- the two choices I'm given, I'm not given the choice to just be accepted, like to do what I want and be accepted. I have to either no, change you give my up behavior. No, doing what you want. I mean, some yeah. people live lives of quiet desperation, suppressing yeah. what they actually want in order to be, you know, <laughs> to be supposedly appreciated by people they shouldn't care about. Okay, well, I didn't choose I that. Do. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> I do. I refuse to choose that. Yeah yeah, yeah, yeah. So you get on a plane. How do yeah. you know where to go? How do you know who to talk to? How do you know what to do? I had four years to research. I was researching what companies were ethical, where I could go, that my body type, because they were still like, um, in terms of my body type, there were companies that were specifically catering to that. So there was a company in Miami, Florida, who I contacted. They specialized in large natural boobs. So I was like, looked at all their magazines and saw the girls looked exactly like me. They had the had boobs like me. And they were flying models from all around the world to different countries. And what I noticed, because I was <laughs> getting these magazines every month, was that these models were coming back time and time again. And my rationale at that age was like, well, they wouldn't keep coming back if the company was acting unethically. Yep. So I was like, this one, this is a safe place for me to go. So back then I... I had a CD-ROM, old school disc, <laughs> of amateur photos that my friends had taken and a handwritten letter that I sent snail mail to the company Amazing. in Miami. And they said, yes, absolutely, we want you. What Come friends do you go to to ask them to take photos, erotic photos of you? Just the friends that accept me, really, girls and guys. They didn't find that weird? Well, if they did, they... <laughs> they didn't say <laughs> no, it. they didn't Good. say it. I think they just knew that that's, mm. that's just Angela. <laughs> and how did you know what to do? Were you just sort of absorbing the poses and things that you'd seen from oh, porn no, online? No, my or? poses were terrible. <laughs> like you'd think I would have after watching, looking at so much uh, glamour pornography that my poses would be down. No, they weren't. But it's kind of um, it's kind of cute looking back at that Yeah, photos. do you ever look back on those photos? Yeah, it's been a while, but looking back, it's because it's a little cringy as well to but see myself like. Oh. How does that make you feel? <laughs> it's, it's good to see how far I've come. Yeah, it's really nice to see that I've I've learnt my good side and my bad side and mm. how how to position myself to look <laughs> as hot as I possibly can because that takes time to yeah. to learn that you really learn that on the job. And do you what do you think when you I mean I don't know if you remember the last time you looked at those photos of you as what 16 17 18 18 you yeah. would have been at the time yeah. oh so yeah. for, for legal reasons you have to insist no 18. pictures were ever taken prior Never. to the age of 18. Yeah. yeah. Um <laughs> Like when you see that girl, what would you say to her if good you job. could talk to her? I would say good job. Yeah, because it was the fact that I did just do what I wanted, even though I could have just gone with the pressure and stopped having sex with people or maybe 
been a little bit more quiet about it yeah. and, you know, just gone into a regular job, even though that's not what I wanted, I think. Yeah. And was the, so they flew you out to they Miami? They flew me out. And what yeah. was that experience like? What, what were the first few months in Florida like? Well, so um, I only went out for, I believe it was a week and a half okay, for great. that, that yeah. first shoot. And that's essentially, and were you in a film or is that an audition process? Yeah, no, I was in a film. Wow, they get you straight yeah, in. Yeah, yep. Um, so that, my in the beginning of my career, I did eight years of Girl Girl Only. So that first uh, that first trip was just solo, actually. And then right. the second trip, they, they brought me out. And did they decide Girl that or did you, the that Girl was me. Girl thing? Yeah, right. that was me. Why was that? Uh, I've I've always lived by this fuck yeah principle. So if someone asks me if I want to do something and it's not an immediate fuck yeah, then it's a no. Right. And for whatever reason, whenever we'd talk about boy girl and the potential of shooting that, there was always some niggling feeling, and I couldn't always put like couldn't always understand w- why I didn't want to do it, but I just knew it wasn't a fuck yeah. Like when it was, do you want to have sex with girls on camera? It was like fuck yeah. Right. And it wasn't until. After I finished my degree and I graduated and I was in this sort of transitional period of my life that I started thinking about boy girl and getting sexually excited by it and think, yes, I really want to do this. And that's when I decided, okay, now it's time to take the plunge. And when you say that you didn't have the fucky air about um, performing with guys initially and you didn't know why, do you now know why you didn't? I've I've rationalized it, but I don't really know. I just I follow my gut a lot and I just had my guts were like, no, just it's not it's not right. I don't know if um, like the ways I've rushed line, like maybe I felt safer with women. Um, also, uh, once I started doing Girl Girl and I looked because I followed a lot of other performers careers, I was always interested in what other performers were doing and how they were building their brands and how they were keeping themselves safe. And whenever I would see a performer transition from girl girl to boy girl, there would be outrage online from the fans that were only interested in girl girl content. And they'd say there was a real, there was actually a bit of a like misogyny around it. Like, oh, now she's tainted now that she's done boy girl. Like I can't watch her content anymore. So there was a little bit of, okay, so I've, I've built this brand on being a girl girl only performer. If I move into the boy girl sphere, there's a potential that I'm going to lose that fan base or at least lose right. a portion of that fan base. Am right. I also willing to do that? So I've, I've rationalized that aspect of it, but that can't be that can't be all of it because I still had that gut feeling mm. before mm. I had known about that potentiality. Interesting. Interesting. Yeah. So you do these eight films. Is that flying back and forth to Australia no, eight, each time? Eight, Sorry. Eight, eight years of Girl Girl Sorry, only. Eight years. <laughs> yeah. And that's all for the same company in Miami or um, different companies? So... No, a few different companies. So I would, uh, I'd fly over and shoot for them. But then I also started um, performing in the Australian pornography industry, Mm -hmm. which is a very different industry. Yeah, I wanted to know about that. What is the industry like in Australia? Well, I can't speak to what it's like now because I've been living in LA for since 2016. So I don't know how it's changed and evolved. Um, From what I can see, looking uh, from looking abroad, it looks to be more of an OnlyFans space at this at this time. But back then when I was performing, you had your classic glamour mags, you had picture, people, zoo magazine. So I was doing the circle. And for so non-Australians, those are basically sort of, they're kind of gas station. Yeah. They're like cheap gas station magazines. Yeah, it's like booby which are mags. Yeah, yeah, booby mags, yeah. like not hardcore, but kind of yeah. girly mags. Exactly. Yeah. So I, I was doing those. And then there was actually a very big scene in Melbourne specifically and it was very feminist independent grassroots like that was uh, like it was really Melbourne was the hub of ethical porn production in the world Mm. in the early to mid 2000s right yeah um interesting that you say Melbourne because I know that you ran for state parliament did you yeah it was um, sex party Victorian state election yeah for the Australian sex party so I ran for the seat of Richmond the opponent you're uh, for the green party wanted to ban brothels Kathleen Maltzen uh, which raises a really interesting like rift I think about the perception of sex and whether or not sex work is liberating for women or whether it victimizes women and indeed whether or not do you think of by the way just so that I don't mess up my terminology do you think of adult film work as sex work Yes, yes. Yeah, I absolutely. mean, it's, they're all in fundamentally yes. the same basket, right? Good. I just didn't want to. It is. So it is fundamentally in the same basket. Like, it's an, sex work is an umbrella term that encompasses everything from stripping to brothel work, escorting, right, right. porn performance. In this particular case, we were talking about prostitution because it was brothels that the Greens um, candidate wanted to ban. Yes. Um, 
What do you make of that strain of, you know, you'd sort of understand it if it was a Christian conservative. Yes. It's a green. It's a far left person. Yes, it's you a would person think who is supposed to be coming from and probably thinks that they are coming from mm -hmm. the progressive mm -hmm. uh, feminist mm -hmm. standpoint. Yeah. Do you understand that standpoint? I do. I mean, I, when, when I say I understand it, I mean, I, I understand their arguments. I disagree with them fundamentally. Also, I think that um, a lot of the anti-porn feminist arguments are very infantilizing to women because sex workers will – who advocate for themselves talk about how when you ban sex work, you send it underground, making women less safe in the industry. And uh, people like Kathleen Moulton and other um, uh, anti-sex work feminists are claiming to save women by doing things that actually harm them. So I don't know this individual, so I don't want to speak for her, but yeah. let me steel man the position, like, mm -hmm. uh, you know, try to make the most generous version of that of that position and see what you, you think of it. So, so, you know, since time immemorial, women have been suppressed by patriarchal power structures. Mm -hmm. Men have basically been running the show. In very Only very recently have women won the ability to be treated equally. And all along, there's been a kind of a false consciousness that women have been fed, which is that they'll find their liberation by either being obedient to their men or being subservient or not put it, kicking up too much of a fuss. And the modern sex work industry is the latest incarnation of a way in which a fundamentally sexist society encourages women to think that they're finding liberation when, in fact, it's the oldest profession and the oldest form of control and, of, and male manipulation mm. that there is. I'm really glad that you mentioned the false consciousness part of it because – so a lot of these anti-porn or anti-sex work feminists argue that sex workers have false consciousness. But, of course, they don't. Somehow they've they've risen above and they don't have false consciousness, but it's the sex workers who they infantilize and say, oh, you can't possibly know what you're doing. You're actually degrading yourself. Right. Yeah. Or you're accidentally complicit in perpetuating systems of oppression. Even if you've managed to escape it, maybe put aside the false consciousness thing. Maybe, like, maybe you've found a way to be... Um, uh, fulfilled and thoroughly enlightened but yet the system that you're working in is one that abuses you know women who don't have your advantages every single day do you mean the system as in the entire system mm, no or... i mean the system of pornography and okay. sex work like okay. that would be the argument I, th I might not be doing a very good job because i don't actually agree with this point of view yeah. but um because I, you could I argue that some... about the, the entire system. If we still live in a patriarchal society, then we're as women, we're all working within it, right? Yes. So you can't – we're not outside of it. No, no one's right. outside of it. Elon Musk may get us there someday and we'll <laughs> okay. be operating from a space station. But okay. so far, yes, we are on planet Earth yeah. operating inside the systems that we are operating yeah. inside of. I guess the argument would be that you're giving sucker to, uh, to specifically an industry that is uh, – founded on the manipulation of women and the superficiality in, of f female appearance and the uh, the turning up the dial on the m on the most sort of male pleasing male gaze aspiring aspect of womanhood but I mean, we're subver subverting the system if anything like sex work is queer in that way like sex work you're as a woman you're supposed to only have sex for procreation and have it for free with one man to whom you are married to. That's how it, that's how sex is supposed to work. When you are asking men to value your time and services and pay you for sex, you're subverting that system. All right, you've won me over. I didn't need a lot. Of, <laughs> didn't need a lot of winning over. I got nothing. I got. We need like a. We need a religious. We need. I mean, it's so bizarre to me. We need a religious conservative and also one of these feminists who would be on the same page. I mean, the same exactly thing comes up with page. surrogacy and the same, and sometimes, yeah. you know, like, so my partner and I, obviously we had to our kids through surrogacy, um, you know, a wonderful woman, an incredibly generous woman. Uh, you know, we, we're friends with her. She's like an auntie to our children. She has a family of her own, <clears throat> um, all above board. And yet what we did in America is illegal in Australia because you're not allowed mm -hmm. to compensate the woman, be, I mean, you're allowed to compensate for literal out-of-pocket expenses, but you can't just say, like, it's a big ask, so here's enough money for a vacation, even. That's against the law. But because there's this alliance between 
religious conservatives mm-hmm. and a certain strand of feminists mm. who think that it's unethical for women to have the ability to benefit financially from renting out their womb, mm. as they always say. Having control over their own bodies yeah. might be another way of putting it, mm. but it always amazes me that you've got this horseshoeing where you've got these feminists who are in bed with, <laughs> metaphorically speaking. Yeah. strange bedfellows. Strange bedfellows, mm-hmm. very strange. What do you make of – how do you feel women's rights are? Like there's a lot of – I have a lot of friends and followers in the States who are extremely anxious about mm-hmm. the conservatism of America, the Supreme Court, about abortion rights and Roe v. Wade and everything. What do you make of that? Yeah, it's it's quite disturbing. Um, I mean, my, my – the what I'm always focused on is – uh, female perform- well performers in general in the pornography industry so that's where my I guess my fight is um, but in terms of women's rights I feel like we're going backwards mm. and what mm. needs to be done in the adult film industry then I feel like we're very good at self-regulating we've had we've changed a lot of things within the industry while the mainstream industry was having its me too movement the porn industry was also having its own me too movement and since that since what did that look like um, very similar to the the mainstream industry in that um, unethical actors were weeded out so anyone any directors or producers that were acting unethically were you know cancelled or removed from their mm. positions and now all of the the big companies have implemented um, consent boundary checklists. So before we actually do any sexual acts on set, the talent sits down with a model liaison and we go over an extensive broad list of sexual acts. And What's a model liaison? A model liaison or a talent liaison is just somebody there who's to advocate for our rights. So right. they're there to – so as performers, we sit down, we go through a list. It goes from like kissing, nipple pinching, cunnilingus, oral, deep throating, spanking. Choking. It go, the list is This is like the worst long. HR yeah. form. Can you imagine? <laughs> I'm just imagining Jan from like the ABC <laughs> HR department going or going down the checklist. Yeah. And cunnilingus, yes, okay, very good. And anal, yeah, exactly. object insertion. So who <laughs> – Who's employing the liaison? Is there like the a company? U- the company does, yes. and they're obliged to. No, it's it's self regulating. They just do it now. Yes, okay. And is there it. a union or something no. of adult workers? No. no, it's we throughout the entire history. It's it has not been possible to unionize. Is that industry. because of the industry or because of laws? It's no. I think it's because I think it's partly because the industry is so diverse. Like it just attracts so many different kinds of people. We're mm. all there for different reasons. It's very it's hurting cats. Yeah, to get it's, them all it's together. very. It just it, it just has not worked. Right. I couldn't give you all the reasons why, but it it hasn't worked. But I love the fact that the big companies are implementing all these protocols for performer safety, even if it is for liability reasons. The fact is that they're keeping performers safe by implementing these checklists. And and prior to that, uh, to that evolution, prior to the Me Too movement, did you have experiences where you'd work with companies that were dodgy? I was in a very privileged position in that by the time I'd moved to the States, I'd already created my own production company. I was already an established director. I had performed in hundreds and hundreds of scenes. So I already had built a brand. So when I finally moved over, like uh, that was the first time I had an agent. I'd done everything on my own up until that point. So by the time I became a Spiegler girl, which is, um, that's part of the, the agency that's the, the biggest and most prestigious agency in LA, um, people, I was only going to get booked by the big companies. I was only right. going to be doing what, you know, like I, I kind of was calling the shots, I yeah. guess is what you would say. So I, I haven't had any uh, negative experiences. Certainly um, I had to advocate for myself, which I was always comfortable doing. I have been from the moment I, I started pornography. I think it's very important if you're going to be in sex work to be able to know your boundaries, advocate for yourself and be able to say no, and as well as a enthusiastic yes. Um, so when before the Me Too movement, the only company that really had these consent checklists was kink.com. And obviously they had it. I mean, they were on the forefront of this and they had it because kink.com is a BDSM site. So what they do is um, far more – it's far more important that mm. we – 
I mean, it's always important, but... There's a whole culture of safe words yes, and of yeah, exactly. uh, kink. Yeah. Yes, exactly. Yeah. Interesting. And do you think, I mean, the Australian industry must be vanishingly tiny in comparison to, uh, even back yeah. then when you were working at it, in comparison to the United States. Do you think you were able to escape some of those interactions, potentially hazardous or dodgy interactions, because you were based in Australia and you were able to kind of build up your reputation here so that when you went back, you didn't have to climb up the ladder well, I actually built States. my brand in the States. So when I created my production company, all the all everything that I shot was in LA. So I was flying back and forth from Australia to LA. So I was really establishing myself in LA while I was living in Australia. Got it. Um, but I think what helped me is that because I was producing and directing myself, I always had so much control on set. How do you make that happen? Like how it's do you, a, like how do you produce business. a movie? You just you just like <laughs> <laughs> I mean you research, you learn a lot on the job, but But like yeah. who fronts up the money? Yeah, me. Yeah. Yeah, you. I was webcamming. Ha- right. So yeah. you, you do webcamming, you make money from that, yep. then you self fund your first movies. Mm-hmm. Well, okay, mm-hmm. you're entrepreneur. So really, I mean it was my fans that funded it. Yeah. Because I'm back in Australia, webcamming, doing a little bit of modeling, but modeling and, and porn pr- performance in Australia, that wasn't enough to right. to give you the income that you need to create a company. So, so this so would have been at the I mean you you were at the early stages of being able to pr- to monetize webcam performing. Mm-hmm. mm-hmm. Yeah, mm. I mean, it was it, webcamming was a fantastic way to build my brand because I was now able everyone's to do it from, doing it. Now every yeah. man and his dog's doing it. Well, now OnlyFans. now that now it's moved on to OnlyFans. OnlyFans yeah. is the the big money maker now. And this is a, a winner take all uh, thing, like so many things in entertainment are. You're at the top of that uh, that pack, mm-hmm. of the OnlyFans pack. Are you what What do you make of the evolution of that? Sight and of like, oh, it's fantastic. How much has exploded? It's been fantastic for performers because the rates have increased because if you're a performer and you can make more money setting up a ring light and a, an iPhone in your bedroom and masturbating mm. than you can going on set and doing a boy-girl scene, the companies really have to entice you both financially and with their their corporate culture and their ethics. They have to in, uh, entice you to come it on certainly set. saves you a 15-hour plane ride to Los Angeles right. as well if you, if <laughs> right, you can exactly. do it from here. You know? Exactly, <laughs> you can yes. just do it all from here. Yeah. Uh, and what about, I mean, obviously that has had an enormous impact on the industry itself and on yeah. what's profitable. Would you be able to make the films that you were making in the early days now and have them become profitable in an era of OnlyFans? Yes, you yes, still. I still, I mean, There's, I still The industry is still since... robust enough? Absolutely, absolutely. But... Um, if I produce a scene for a DVD, because I do have a DVD distribution line, and believe it or not, DVDs still make Who's great money. Who's buying DVDs? Stream things, people. Oh, What's happening? People love DVDs. They're a collector. Really? Right. Yeah, they love to have the physical product. Right. Also, there are still places in the world where the internet connection is not sure. great. So getting a DVD. But can those places afford a $69 DVD? I don't know. Well, <laughs> Not, I don't know that they're sixty nine dollars, but <laughs> it's, a, it's a great price there. Um, <laughs> what do you what do you charge on? What do you charge for a DVD? What's the what's the going? Um, oh, I should know. You this. should know. I should know this. Uh, Someone's been getting a little bit too hoity toity. <laughs> doesn't know her own DVD I prices. I don't know what they are. I think they're about twenty five dollars. Oh wow, that's I a think. bargain. Yeah, I okay. think they are. All right. Uh, so anyway, so <laughs> let's get back to the industry. So I'm interested in um, wh- the what is the the valley in Los Angeles for mm. people who are familiar with LA is a, a bakingly hot uh, oh. part of the the oh, city, yeah. barely <laughs> even part of the city. Really, it's, not, it's yes. not part of the city. It's over the mountains in the north mm-hmm. of the of the city, and it's the world headquarters of the adult film industry, among other industries. But. Yeah. Um, you were talking before we went on the air about how you were doing a group sex scene in the valley in an unair conditioned uh, studio. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> in latex, full latex. Right. Uh, Thigh high boots. Why no air conditioning? <laughs> well, we thirty eight degrees in the shade in San we Fernando have to Valley. Turn the air conditioning off for the noise. Just like here. Yeah. Yet another similarity mm-hmm. between the adult film industry and the Uncomfortable Conversations studio. They're both too hot. Well, now the fans know why I'm so red <laughs> in my scenes, sweating profusely. Yeah, that so they haven't intense. found a solution. Some companies will leave the air conditioning on and then just take it out in post, but a lot of companies like 
would prefer. They don't care <laughs> about you. <laughs> they don't care about you. We need Elon Musk or someone to come up with a silent air conditioner. I think they've gotten better, but I guess, mm. I don't know, those not, mics pick up a lot of sound. Not good enough. Yeah. Um, so your, your tilt at politics was uh, short-lived. Would successful, you ever, but short-lived. Successful, but short-lived. Yeah. Would you consider it again? <laughs> politics is dirtier than porn. <laughs> Much dirtier. Um, I don't think so. I have a lot more fun doing porn. Yeah. But how long does a porn career last? Like, I mean, there is this thing of like once you've had your successful career in porn, then presumably there's a stigma about going. I mean, I mentioned you know Jan from the HR department. Mm-hmm. You go in and you you know you submit your your CV or your your ref- resume, and there's thirty years of adult. Film I and mean, people people are judgy. Yeah, sure. Well, <laughs> <laughs> we'll cross that well, bridge when we come them. to no. it. She says. <laughs> no, I don't think that's not going to be an issue for me. I've been uh, very uh, good with my money, so I mean, I could retire right now if I wanted to, but I enjoy performing so much, so I have no need to retire at this point. Um, so yeah, thankfully I won't. I won't have to deal with that. But I think that other people that are thinking about entering the industry that are maybe not going to be consistent enough to create a career out of it need to consider those things. And what when you say you enjoy it so much, what are you enjoying about it at this stage? Because, yeah. I mean, I have the personality that when I keep doing something for a few years, then I sort of, you know, vaguely kind of want to, want to wander off and do something else and yeah. explore different things. What still... What still appeals? Are you, are you are you still having sex? You're not bored of sex, right? You're not bored I'm not of bored sex. I'm not bored of sex. No. Yeah. No, I'm, that's true. Sex that's is true. very creative. And the but thing- you, but I'm not suggesting that you would give up sex. I'm I'm suggesting that you there would come up there would come up, yeah well there would come a point at which having the grip holding the light while you're having sex yeah. and having a bunch of people just standing around near the craft services table with a bunch of sandwiches <laughs> just off you know off camera. While someone's coming on your face, you might be like, "Can we? Just, can he just come on my face in private? Do we need to have the lighting guy in the room?" It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Plus, you develop a friendship with these people. Like the the more you shoot with someone, the better your chemistry. You're building that connection with them. Right. So each time you have sex with them, it gets better and better and better. And then there's always new performers coming in. So you've got. I mean, I, it's. I love to explore my sexuality with different people. I feel like sex is a conversation and I don't just want to have a conversation with one person for the rest of my life. I feel like I learn more things about myself and about others when I'm connecting with them in an intimate way. It's a lot of fun. It's creative venture. Mm. And I yeah. guess you've now reached a level of status where when those young people do come in, they might be a little bit starry-eyed and, <laughs> and like kind of excited. About- yeah, to be honest, now um, I actually – I don't work with brand, brand, brand new performers. I wait till they've kind of gone, done done a few scenes first, got some under their belt because um, it can be a little bit much. Right. And do you have a preference of sex at the moment, of which gender I mean? No, no. You do both still? Everything. Yeah. Yeah. And Everyone. You mentioned that there are some performers who you like to go back to because you build that relationship. Yeah. Do you have a stable of particular favourites? I do. I'm not going to get you to yeah, name no, them. Yeah, no, I don't. <laughs> uh, I mean, well, my fans will know because they'll see me working with them again and again and yeah, again and right, again. Yeah, right, right. And what's yeah. your relationship like offset? Like, do you guys yeah. catch up? Do you hang out? Do you ever have sex off screen? It depends on the person. I I've found it's better to keep a little bit of distance because once you start having sex with your co-workers off screen you kind of lose some of the magic on set Mm. so i like to keep that sexual tension for when we're at work yeah if you start having sex with them off camera firstly it can create drama that's why you know don't date within the industry yeah because if you have a falling out then there's one less male talent or female talent that you can work with and Mm. especially male talent there's not many to go around so you don't want to be in a situation where they end up on your no list why is there not much male talent to go around it's a very tough job it's a very hard job (laughs) (laughs) it is it's it's there are pharmacological solutions to that problem sure there are now there are now but it's um it's still a tough job even even with those solutions, you still have to be aroused and you have to be aroused in front of numerous mm. people. And depending on the set, that could be anywhere from five people to 25 people. It's uh, You have to be able to have stamina 
um, in on very very hot days with no air conditioning you need to be able to fuck on anything anywhere I've had scenes where I've been fucking on a rock outside in summer you know it's it's difficult. Mm. It's dif- I mean, it's difficult for every performer, but mm. um, the male performers have an additional thing to worry about, which is keeping their their dick hard. And how frequently is it that there's a problem there, that like you're halfway through a scene and it's just not – the person isn't up to it? I'm very picky about the people that I shoot with, so I'm really working with the, the, the top, best of top, the best. Yeah, top male talent who can get hard and stay hard in any environment. And across the industry, though, do you have an estimation? Like, I mean, if, if we took a snapshot right now of all the adult films that are being shot <laughs> globally, <laughs> what fraction of them are running into problems with their with oh, the stamina yeah, of their there was definitely, male stars? Look, when I first uh, started producing and directing, and not when you're on the ground in LA and you have all those informal uh, information networks, you hear on set about like who's struggling on set or right. who who can perform and who can't perform, and so it's much easier when you're doing your casting to be like, okay, we're going to get these two people, or even like. Um, maybe a male talent is great, but they're they're not great at a particular sex act, um, or they're not great with you know this girl who's friends with their ex girlfriend. You know, like mm, there's mm. you you learn all these things on the ground. But when I was coming across from Australia, I was just booking the male talent that I saw on sets and like, oh, he he looks great or he looks very passionate, and then you know finding out on set, oh, okay, he he struggles when it's too hot. Or, Interesting. Yeah, and is there so, an age thing to it? I mean, most people would think that a 22-year-old is going to be able to get hard and go like the clappers, whereas a 38-year-old might not. Is that true? No, that's not true. I think the older male talent are are more solid, in my opinion. Yeah. Good to know. Uh, yeah. I'm, Especially I'm, I'm, like I'm, older I'm, European. I'm holding the flame <laughs> yeah. for, uh, for yeah. uh, the perfect age group. I'm yeah. I'm flattered. But maybe uh, that could be biased because I'm more sexually attracted to Older well, men. I mean, it so, could also be that, yeah. that, that just by definition, if you're not good, then you don't stay around in the industry for that long. And right. So by definition, if you've yeah. lasted until you're 38, then it means that you had something yeah. to begin with. Yeah. Why European? Why do you say that? The Europeans are kinkier. Like they're more perverted. And I know I'm generalizing, but I'm just talking about you know, the group of European male talent right. within the LA industry that are at the top okay. of their game. Not the 350 million <laughs> Europeans, <laughs> yeah, not the right. old Polish right. grandma, but maybe... Uh, but just specifically this subset of European men. And what are they, Germans or...? Um, French, Italian... The lovers. Yeah, the lovers. Right. Yeah, Spanish. I think of the Germans as being like very uptight, but also with like weird... You know, kinks, you know, because they're they're so buttoned up and they're so, they're not allowed, they have no, they have no passion or love in their culture. So they end up just shitting on each other's faces when they get inside (laughs) a closed room. Whereas the Italians and the French, obviously, are much more expressive about romance. Mm. They're very, very good lovers. Are they? Yes. I'm I'm French Australian, so that's just so good to go. know. There uh, you go. Little flex. How have, <laughs> little, <laughs> little big flex. Um, how have how have beauty standards changed over the time that you've been in the industry? I mean, you you, you can see the norms of what women look like mm. change in the past five or ten years. There's been a much more. Um, I think aggressive uptake of quite an openly cosmetic surgery look Mm -hmm. um, with lip fillers and Botox Mm -hmm. and stuff Mm -hmm. going from being things that people are using just to try to give them a little tweak to try to look 10 years younger to Mm -hmm. now being an actual type of looking or a way Mm -hmm. of looking or a type Mm -hmm. of Kardashianized face. Um, Is that true in porn as well? What do you make of that trend? Like there's a market for everything and everyone. So no matter what your body type or whether you're naturally, you know, got the natural look or the purposely enhanced sex doll look, there's a market for you. But if you look at the the top row of performers on Pornhub, so the, the performers that are searched the most, the most popular performers uh, usually have the more natural look. And I would guess that has something to do with the attainability, I'll put that in like quotation marks, um, like the idea that you'll, you'll notice that the, the most popular women in porn um, have a natural look that like you, it's more of a girl next door look. Like yep. there's a potential that you might meet this woman on the street and – have a date with her and suddenly she's sucking the soul out of your dick like a demon. You know, like there's something about that sexual fantasy, like there's a chance Mm. that I could have sex with her 
and yep. it would be the most incredible sex of my life. And when we talk, we're coming back to this conversation about whether or not porn and uh, like adult and like sex work is a victimizing phenomenon or a liberating one. You obviously found it to be liberating. Yeah. Now there's this whole parallel conversation about beauty standards, right? And you were mm. saying that when you were a kid, all of the images of models that you saw were this very cliched, unrealistic, skinny, waifish mm. thing. Now it's more diverse in terms of body yeah. size. And yet it's more conformist in this pursuit of what the, what the perfect face looks mm. like. Do you regard it as being a liberating feminist thing that there are so many neighborhoods in so many cities where women are aspiring towards the same type of look, or is that a constraining thing? Uh, I, I'm as a as a feminist myself. I feel like women should have the right to do what they want with their body, whether that's enter pornography and have sex with as many people as they want, or whether that's also their appearance. I think that. Uh, you know, as long as they're not feel. I mean, I don't know. It's a, it's a really tough. I mean, it comes down to sort of the false consciousness thing again, doesn't it? I mean, it, well, I, I, don't, I can I can feel your reticence to about judging other yeah, women. I, and I get that. Yeah, like, nobody yeah. wants to ban people from getting lip fillers, mm-hmm, right? Mm-hmm. But when you go to a conservative Muslim society and you see all women veiled, and you go and and. Muslim feminists will say that's their sense of expression, that's their sense of self, like uh, that, that for them that is a feminist uh, drive that they mm-hmm. feel is being expressed by the wearing of the veil. They feel protected, they feel, um, they feel like that is enriching to them. I always think, yeah, but you can't really know that because they're living in an environment in which mm. there are so many cultural penalties for not doing that and so many unspoken advantages to doing it mm. that it's not a fully free choice mm-hmm. and I can and then they say well what about the women on your in <laughs> in the west who are all you know dressed up and dolled mm-hmm. up and they've all got the lip fillers and the Botox and the bikini the same bikinis on the beach where is their cultural right to be more humble mm. there are all these incentives to look that way culturally and disincentives not to look that way and I find myself thinking Okay, maybe there is a bit of misguided priorities going around all over the place. But why are we focusing on women? Men have the same Absolutely. pressures. Absolutely. Absolutely. But you're a woman and you work in that industry. But if you want to ask me about yeah. men, I'll, yeah. <laughs> I'll talk about I'll talk but, about. But well, it. I guess I just find that a lot of the time these debates are happening it's always like about women getting plastic surgery and I and and men are just like out of the picture. Like obviously there's pressures on men to look a certain way, to have a well, certain Well, I mean, I'd certainly structure. say that that uh, 10 or 15 years ago, I think it may have been more pronounced with men in that mm-hmm. young guy, the whole metrosexual phase, mm-hmm. right? Where young guys were going were transitioning from a burly, hairy, like masculine George Clooney, Gregory Peck version of masculinity to the, I guess, Timothy Chalamet, like wayfish kind of like, mm-hmm. you know, everything being pruned and preened and uh, and hairless. Then, yeah, I would say that that, that is a, a way in which they're chasing something that is um, – that is imposed by the culture in invisible ways. But do you think it's imposed in the same way as it was a decade or two decades ago because of the democratisation of, like, body types within the media? I I feel like there's not one look that's prescribed for men or for women. So isn't it... That's true. Like... I don't know. I feel like it's we're in a better place right now because it's not just one beauty standard. There's There are different ways that you can be beautiful that are accepted within society now. Yes, and I suppose you're. Wi- I'm talking about being within a cohort or a sub-community in which there are quite obvious norms. I mean, yeah. like there are suburbs in Sydney in the eastern suburbs where everybody <laughs> is aspiring to the same look. It's quite amazing. I mean, you walk mm. down the street in Bondi and there is a Kardashianization of mm. female aesthetics it's and undeniable porn, it's not like that though like if you want to look at the as i was saying like with the you know the top performers on Pornhub, yeah and i say that only because it's that's visible to people whereas you know the top performers on other sites are yeah more, it's more secretive yeah you'll notice that there's they don't all look the same there's not this sort of um like a porn look like all different mm. shaped noses some lips are enhanced some lips are not enhanced you know you've got me it. on there with big natural boobs and then you've got riley reed who's almost flat chested like it's so diverse 
what's popular. All that all that means to me is that the people who are chasing the particular Botox look are in a false consciousness because that's not actually what people want. That's not what people are watching. It's not what people are aroused by. But they're all pursuing it anyway. I have pressure to not get a nose job. I have a deviated septum. That's really bad, actually, for my breathing. Like, really? Yeah, like my left nostril collapses 80% and my right nostril collapses 100%. Look at that. Wow. It's really bad. But Is that I know- from cocaine or something? No. <laughs> no, it's just from having a nose that who knows. It just okay. – I was born this way. Right. So I've always had, I've always struggled to breathe out of my nose. But I know that if I change my look at all, like my fans follow me because, well, there's many reasons why I have like a very loyal fan base. But obviously part of it has to do with the way I look. And- to hear the rest of this conversation, go to uncomfortableconversations.substack.com slash listen and you will get your own personal premium podcast feed with at least three extra episodes of the podcast every month and heaps of extra stuff, including the remainder right now of the fabulous conversation you've just been hearing. If it was worth listening to this much of, don't rob yourself of the rest. Pull out your phone right now and search for Uncomfortable Conversations with Substack. Substack.